All right. <clears throat> so obviously there's a lot going on this week for our church, as there will be every, every time this time of year, because we started right before Thanksgiving. And um, I'm going to be preaching this morning about giving thanks. We have a lot to be thankful for. And I know I personally have a lot to be thankful for. But, um, you know, this, this today marks our one-year anniversary. This church has been in existence for one entire year. And I'll tell you right off the bat, one thing I'm real thankful for is, as I mentioned in the announcements, that there's so many people that, that helped us to get started that have come back even after our one-year anniversary to, to show up for this event. And I'm very thankful for that. But what's really important with with Remembering to, being, to be thankful and to be a thankful person in general. This is something that, that we need to, to evaluate on a regular basis in our life. We need to have thanks in our heart. It's not something that we ought to have just one time a year. Right? I mean, thanks. there's nothing wrong with celebrating Thanksgiving. I love it. It's a great holiday. It's a good time to, to step back, to reflect on things in your life. And I think it's really important that we all ought to do that, to just, just step back from your, from your hectic, busy life and just think about all the good things that have happened in your life. But this isn't something that we should be doing just once a year. We need to, to ha maintain a proper attitude. And this is found in Scripture quite a bit. And we're going to go into a lot of that about how we need to have the right attitude and we need to be giving thanks for the things that we have. And just as an example about having the right attitude, you know, when I, when I look at our church, I can have a few different reactions depending on what I'm focusing on. If I focus on the size of our church in general, just week after week, I might get discouraged. I could look at that and say, oh man, you know, we're just, we're real small, we're real little. And if that's what I'm focusing on, if I'm just focusing on how many bodies are sitting in the seats... I might, I might get discouraged or I might be tempted to, to compromise, to just to start doing different things against what the Bible says just to get more people in here. But that's not my focus. And if I were to do that, of course, I'd be relying on my own abilities anyways to build this church instead of relying on God to do it. I could also focus on all the hard work that's involved because starting a church is a lot of work and 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 doing all this stuff and I could maybe end up getting bitter and just start getting miserable and saying, man, I'm putting in all this work and I just don't have time for this and I've got a family, I've got a job and I've got all this other stuff going on and I could just get, get focused in on, on the work aspect of church and just say, well, this is just too much work and maybe I'll just throw my hands up in the air and give up. Those are attitudes you don't want to have. Those are, those are the wrong things to be focusing on. Or I could look at the quality of the people that are here. And I could say, you know what, our church isn't very big. I mean, we've been here for one year. And again, it's still only one year. It's our infancy stage. You think about a one-year-old child, how big are they <laughs> in general when they're, when they're one year old? They're not that big. Little Sarah's a little over one year, and she's not that big. And we're going to have a normal growth as this church. But um, <clears throat> what I like way more then the actual numbers is the quality of the people that are here. The, the, the members that have been here, Brother Anderson and the Tiberics, uh, that have been coming faithfully just pretty much since the very beginning of this church, I could see the growth in everybody's lives personally, in my own life, in my, the, wife of my, the life of my family, and everybody that's been coming here. I could see the growth. I could see how much they love God and are serving God and are doing more for Him now because we're gathered together and we're in a church that, that we're in one, in one mind with one accord. And I look at that and that gives me a lot of encouragement. And I could pray and, and you know, I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for the fact that God's led me here and I know, especially with Brother Anderson, he lives one street over and has been coming since, I don't know what, a few weeks into it, maybe, however long it took me to get over there. Yeah. <laughs> it, was about, it was about as long as it took before you started coming to church. And I, I am extremely thankful for that, and I'm thankful to God for, for all that He has done in the building of this church. Now, what we decide to focus on and our point of view is going to have the biggest influence on the joy that we have in our life. Okay? Um, it, it, like I mentioned earlier, if I, if I were to focus on just the size or just the amount of work, I'm not going to be 
having a lot of joy in my life because I'm going to be focused on things that are stressing me out, that are, that are and then they're the wrong things to focus on. They're going to um, cause me to have a poor attitude and not to be thankful for all the things that I do have. See, if I'm focusing on things that are negative and maybe things that are going bad or things that are going wrong, I'm definitely not going to be leading a very joyful life. Now, of course, living the Christian life is a lot of work. It is. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor of a church or not. Just trying to live according to, the, to the, what God has laid out for us in His Word is a lot of work. And, and sometimes you may get overwhelmed. Sometimes you may feel, you know, we're all going to have those ups and downs in our life. Between the prayer, the Bible reading, the soul winning, even just showing up to church, trying to memorize scripture, doing all of these different things that you know are important in your Christian life, it could be very difficult. You may start to get overwhelmed or discouraged or even just burned out, but you have to stick with it. You have to stay focused on the right things. And that will help you to get through this endurance race that we have as the Christian life so that you can look back on your entire life and hopefully God will be able to say to you, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, and a, lot, a lot of us being able to get through that is going to be focusing on the right things and being having a thankful attitude for the things that we do have. Let's look in this chapter where we started off reading in Ephesians chapter 1. I mean, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, in verse number 1, we're going to start rereading a little bit of this chapter. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness and, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So here he's contrasting, you know, living a life of sin with the fornication and cleanness, covetousness, you know, wanting things that, that don't belong to you, that belong to someone else. And then he starts talking about your conversation, your filthiness, foolish talking and jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Instead of getting caught up in, in speaking, just basically talking like the world talks. The filthiness of this world. Foolish talking, talking about things that, that just are kind of stupid, that don't really matter. You know, jesting and, and just having this, this type of an attitude and just always speaking about these types of things. He says, rather, you need to be giving thanks and, and not get caught up in all of the rest of this stuff. We need to have an attitude where we're giving thanks. Let's jump down to verse number 15 of Ephesians 5. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I pause right there. You know, we're, this week is the week we celebrate Thanksgiving. And I know I've always heard it been said that Wednesday night is one of the biggest bar nights of the year. People go out and they like to party because nobody has work on Thursday. So people like to go out and just get intoxicated and, and celebrate that way, I guess, just because they don't have to wake up early and go to work the next day. And even just during the holidays, you know, a lot of people have family, you know, getting together with family, but it tends to be a time, depending on your family, where, where people might have the booze out. You know, Christmas, they're going to have the eggnog out. They're going to have the wine with the turkey at dinner. And we as Christians, you ought to make sure that you don't partake in any of this stuff. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Don't get caught up in the, the traditions and celebrations of these events by, by partaking in the alcohol that, that in many cases is found, and especially going out. You know, you ought never to be stepping foot into a bar. I don't care. If you're saved, that is not the place for you. But... Um, Let's keep reading here. Speaking to yourselves in verse 19, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. 
<clears throat> Notice he follows that up, not being drunk with wine, with giving thanks always for all things unto God. Very applicable for Thanksgiving Day for the celebration that we're going to have. But look, he says, giving thanks always for all things. We need to be thankful for everything in our life. Not, not even just necessarily the good things. Okay, we need to be thankful for all things that we have. And it's easy to get complacent with the things that we already have. It's easy to get to a point where, you know, maybe things are going well for you. And you're getting used to living a certain way. Maybe, maybe God has blessed you and he's given you some raises at work and you're starting to get a little bit comfortable and you start get and this is human nature. We all have to watch out for this. No matter what, no matter how much money you have or how much physical wealth you have, it's easy to just come to expect that those things, of course they're there. Of course they're always going to be there. Why wouldn't they be there? Instead of being thankful for God, thank you so much for what you've done. See, usually what would be is we'll be thankful right away. You get that, that raise at work, you'll be like, oh man, praise God. Thank you so much for allowing me to, to make a little bit more money to, to help me make ends meet and, you know, and to relieve a little bit of the difficulty and the stress that I'm having right now in my life. But then maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks later, a month, it's just back to, man, I, I need to make more money. Oh man, I need to get another job or whatever. You know, we ought not to have that type of an attitude. Again, that's focusing on the wrong thing. If you're always, if your mindset's never satisfied, if you're never content with the things that you have, you're always going to be miserable. And that's wickedness too, by the way. That's wickedness because what that is, is that's, that's covetousness in, in most cases where you're thinking that what God has given me isn't enough, so I'm not going to be satisfied with what I have, and I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to complain, and I'm going to just forget the fact that God has given me everything that I have in my life. And that's why we need to give thanks always for all things unto God. It's so easy to look at what other people have and say, oh man, you know, if I was in their shoes, that, that would be great. That's wickedness. That's covetousness. We have a lot to be thankful for. And I don't care, I don't care who you are, what situation you're in. It doesn't matter. You, you can be, you know, if you're, if you're saved this morning, if you've received that free gift of eternal life, you have a lot to be thankful for. I mean, even if you were living in a, in a cardboard box in this cold weather that we have today, now, you have a lot to be thankful for. And, and the way your mindset is, is going to determine a lot about how you live your life. And, and if you get caught up focusing on the negative, you're never going to improve anyways. You're never going to actually move forward and be productive and be a good worker for Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. It's just a, a, a few more pages over to the right from Ephesians 5, Colossians chapter 1. <sighs> Look at verse number 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Lord, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins that reason alone that's why it says giving thanks unto the father we ought to give thanks for the fact that God has forgiven us of our sins and that's a big deal you think of that word forgiveness that means it's not going to be mentioned to you ever again all of the wrongs that you've done in your life. And if you just take a step back and think about those things, and the older we get, the list gets longer and longer and longer, right? I mean, because you sin probably every single day. But I, I could think of the things that I've done, and it could literally almost bring me to tears because I've, I've done so many wicked things in my life. 
and I think about those things now with the understanding that I have now as opposed to back then and it's bad and you know we all can look at our life and, I, and you know I'm maybe not everyone here has done some of the things that I've done in my life but whatever you know God has a sentence of hell on all of our sins so <laughs> we can all look at what we've done and say that was really bad what I've done in the past and even what you've done maybe even recently you know but you think about those things and the fact that you know what God loved me so much he's given me this free gift and he says it's all it's all wiped away I am gonna forgive you of that and forget about it it's over it's done. It's, it's no longer going to be mentioned to you again. As far as the east is from the west, so far with God separate us from our sins. That is, is an amazing thing to think about. And that, that is the, the most important thing that we need to give thanks. So when you have your Thanksgiving dinner this week, when you, when you take a step back and, and if you actually recognize the fact that you're, you're going to give thanks, give thanks first and foremost to our Lord Jesus Christ who has saved you. Because God has given us all, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh, th cometh um, from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. He, um, he's the one who gives us the, thing, the good things that we have. And the forgiveness of sins, it trumps anything else, anything that could possibly go wrong in your life. Think about that. Now, we just, we just preached last week uh, on um, John chapter 19 on our Wednesday Bible study. And it's all about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but when you think about what he went through for us, and then you look at your own life, especially when you, when you start to focus on the wrong things. And I want you to keep this in your mind. And it's important to have this type of an attitude where when you start to go through the down times, the bad times, and you start to get distracted and you're not being thankful for the things that you have anymore, and, and things go bad... Keep in mind what Christ went through for you because I guarantee you no matter what you're going through, it's not going to be like what he went through. When you think about the whippings and the beatings and the spitting and the hanging on a cross, I, I, it's very unlikely that anybody in this room is going to be nailed to a cross and left to die. Where, where all of your bones are out of joint and you can look down and count your ribs because you've been whipped and beaten so bad that your bones are literally showing through your flesh. And you think about the pain and the suffering and everything that Jesus Christ went through, all of a sudden your perspective might start to change. All of a sudden you have, you know, I've got a house and two cars and all this other stuff and I'm going to be complaining about my pipe bro broke or something and just, and just start getting all upset over that. And, and get in a bad attitude. Why can't anything ever go right for me? Do you have a warm house? you got warm clothing? You've got food? Be careful because, look, this can affect all of us. Having this type of attitude can affect everybody. We need to be on guard against this because all that's going to do is just lead this downward spiral of, of, of incontentment, of covetousness, and of looking on things that you don't have and just, and just having a poor attitude and a poor spirit. And it's going to affect your walk with God and your Christian life. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Now, if you be sitting here this morning and say, you know what, I, I am very thankful for what God has given me. You know, I, I look at my life and I, and I thank God for the, you know, I appreciate what he's done for me and, and it really does sit, you know, drive home in my heart that, that I am thankful. If you truly are thankful, then show it unto God. And there's one way of doing that we see here in, in Hebrews, not only one way, but in what we see here in Hebrews 13, we're going to start reading in verse 15. You know, maybe you're someone that doesn't normally like to sing the hymns in church. Maybe you just kind of keep quiet. You don't sing. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 15. The Bible says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. This is the sacrifice that we can make today. 
This is a sacrifice. We don't have the animal sacrifices anymore, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't want us still offering sacrifices unto him. Obviously, it's not animal sacrifices, but he says here, offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. It doesn't even just say, you know, oh, only when you meet on Sunday morning for church. He says, offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. This is something that we all ought to be doing. And if you're thankful, that's why he says, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Many of the, the, the hymns and the songbook are songs of thanksgiving to God. And it's praising and extolling his name and just, just honoring the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and just being very thankful. And if you have a problem being thankful in your life, maybe you should force yourself to start singing hymns and praises to God a little bit more often because that can help your attitude to change too. When you start getting this, the, the, the hymns and, and praising God, it can sink into your head and into your heart thinking, you know what? I, and I know for myself personally, when I'm singing the hymns, just even at home, my attitude changes. I feel a little bit better. I feel a little bit more joyful. I could be having a really bad day. It's the same thing when I go out soul winning. Sometimes I'll be in a rotten mood and, and you know, just, just kind of uh, things aren't working out very well. And you get in those, in those places. And we ought not to. But look, I know this happens. This happens to everybody. It's a common thing that happens with, with mankind. But we need to try to avoid this as much as possible and doing, fulfilling the things of God, whether it be singing hymns or even going out soul winning. Like I was saying, when I go out soul winning, you know, I could be in a, in a bad mood when I leave, but, I, but every time I come back, it's like I'm always in a good mood. Always. You forget about all of those other things that are going on in your life because really... They're not that important, especially when you're, when you're trying to, to persuade someone to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save their soul from an eternity of hell. Hey, all of a sudden, you know, your concerns don't look nearly as important as what you're dealing with at that time. It's, um, it's a way to help you to get your, your mindset right. And these are all things that you, you can do in your life and you need to just focus and work on them and incorporate them into your schedule, whether it be singing, praying, reading the Bible, you know, all of these things that we can do to, to stay in this close communication with God will help us to get our hearts and our attitudes right. Let's look at some of the, so the songs that, that do give a lot of thanks to God. Look at Psalm 30. Flip back in your Bible to Psalm 30 because... You know, Hebrews 13 said we need to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Let's look at some of the Psalms. Of course, the Psalms is, our, is a song book. Psalm 30. We're going to start reading in verse number 3. Psalm 33 says, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at his remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Here we see, of course, this psalm giving thanks for what we were just talking about, for our salvation. He's saying, look, you've brought up my soul from the grave. You've kept me alive that I am not, you know, I should not go down to the pit. It's a great thing to be thankful for. And he's saying, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. This is what we need to do. We need to be giving thanks unto God. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. And remember this, weeping may endure for a night. You may have sadness and sorrow and things going on. He says, but joy cometh in the morning. Look ahead for the next day. Don't get caught up and in, in, in bogged down with, with, the, with the cares of this world. And um, be thankful. Give thanks unto God. Look at Psalm 35, just a few pages over. Psalm 35, verse number 18. He says, I will give thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. So again, he's equating here giving thanks with singing praises in church. Show God your thanks for, him, for what he's done for you by singing praises. You might say, oh, well, I don't sing that. I don't have a really good voice. Oh, wait, did he say, 
uh, give thanks among the congregation, but only if your voice sounds good according to who? No, that's not what he says. Look, God wants to hear you sing. Don't worry about what the person next to you is going to think. Don't worry about yourself. Don't have so much pride to thinking that like, oh, if I can't sing with the best voice, then I'm not going to sing at all. God wants to hear you give him thanks. God has done quite enough for you already. Give thanks unto his name. Sing praises. Sing, sing unto him. Be thankful and give him that sacrifice. And even if you have the worst voice in the world and you know it, have the humility to offer that up still as a sacrifice and say, you know what? Because, look, serving the Lord in many ways and, and voicing your beliefs is going to make people look at you funny sometimes. You might be ridiculed. You might have people making fun of you at work. And the only reason I could think of it why someone who doesn't have a very good voice might not want to sing is because they don't want people thinking, oh, man, that guy sings, you know, sings lousy and start making fun of him. Well, hey, if someone were to do that, God forbid someone would do that in this church, but if someone were to do that, hey, you know what? Just praise the Lord and say, God, I'm just going to do this anyways. God's going to be pleased with what you're doing and you don't have to worry about that person. God will take care of that person. But that'll be even more of a sacrifice to God and he'll be even more pleased with what you do if you just do it anyways and not worry about what people are going to think about you or say about you. Look, and, and this whole song, this sermon isn't all about singing. I've, I've already preached a sermon called The Sacrifice of Praise. Um, we ought to be praising God. This is something I believe that every Christian should be doing. It's going to help you to give thanks, as I mentioned earlier. But, um, but we need to do this. It's a command. It's an imperative in the Bible. It says, praise ye the Lord. Over and over again in the Psalms. But it says here, I will give thanks in the great congregation, in the, in the church, when there's a lot of people here, or, and even when there's not a lot of people here. <laughs> in the church, I will give the thanks, and I will praise thee among much people. Turn to uh, Psalm 92. <laughs> Psalm 92, verse 1 says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. So here, you know, again, there's so many reasons to be thankful. Thankful for our salvation, but thankful for God's loving kindness and his faithfulness. The fact that he's never going to leave us. He's faithful to us. That is something that we could be very thankful for. Now, Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're done in the book of Psalms. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to see here that giving thanks is actually commanded. It's something that we ought to do. This is something that was exhorted by, by the Apostle Paul and for, to Timothy. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, the Bible reads, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, obviously it's important that we give thanks to God, right? And that's, He's first, He's foremost, give thanks to God, give thanks to Jesus Christ, sing praises unto God and unto His name. Now we hear, we see here, that we're being exhorted, as Timothy was, to give thanks, he says, be made for all men. Be thankful for those in your life. Be thankful for those around you. Now, um, the Bible says, we'll keep reading here in verse 2, it says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, this giving of thanks is, is mingled in here with the supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, but it's all part of the same spirit. So 
When you're making supplications and prayers unto God, you're making requests unto Him. When you're making intercessions, you're actually interceding for somebody else. You're still praying to God, but it's, it's, you have somebody else in mind. You're making an intercession for that person. You are coming, you know, in a way, you're not mediating, but you're coming in between them and God and you're saying, hey God, help this person out and giving of thanks. So this is, this is all part of this having the same type of a spirit and the same type of an attitude where you're, you're going to God for your needs, you're interceding for others, you're giving thanks for all men. And, and when especially, it says, not especially, but it says for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So when you are praying for people that are in authority, we're praying with the end result that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And you know, we have a lot to be thankful for today, even in this country, even with how wicked things are going. And even though, you know, the United States is turning into a police state and we're losing liberties, we're losing freedoms, we still have a lot to be thankful for. And we ought to thank God for the, for the freedoms that we do have because we're still able to go out and preach the gospel. We're still able to congregate together. We're still able to preach God's word we still have these freedoms. And if we're going to be praying about, about things and praying for those that are in authority, we need to pray that they'll not, you know, not be removing our freedoms to do the things that we're doing to serve God, that we can live peaceably and in all godliness and honesty, that we can continue to do the work that God has laid out for us to do. So we need to pray that, that you know, these things won't be removed from us and give thanks that we still do have these freedoms and that, and that we are able to do this. We're able to meet together and, and, um, and serve God without the, the extra hassle of, of government breathing down our necks. As they're starting to do already, like we already saw in Texas with that, that sodomite lesbian governor or mayor or whatever she is, mayor I think, Trying to, trying to stifle the, the speech of some churches down there that are against their homosexual agenda and allowing men to use women's restrooms and women to use men's restrooms just because they say they're confused about which one they are. This is what's happening today in the world. Okay? So, <laughs> prayer definitely needs to be made. Now, that, that, that hater of God needs to just be ousted and and out of the picture completely but w all the more reason though that we need to be in prayer and we need to be making supplications and prayers and intercessions to God because when haters of God get into that position of authority and power, they are going to remove our freedoms. They're going to make it so that we are not able to live a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty and they bring their perverted view on this world and, and start forcing everyone to accept it and to live in that way. I mean, what kind of... It's, it's utter nonsense. It's literally like an animal. It's a thinking of an animal. Yep. To just say, well, we, you know... Men and women, yeah, you could just, it's a, you know, it's a public restroom, so it doesn't even matter. Instead of actually having the decency to, in the common sense, <laughs> to separate the men's room from the women's room. But that, that's a whole, no, I, don't, I really don't want to get off on that tangent this morning. And, okay, but that brings up another good point, because you can look at these things around you, and they should fire you up. It should stir you up. It should get you motivated to do more, to speak out more, to try to reach more people and to voice your concerns. But don't get caught up, again, in, in all these things that are going on to where you start focusing on the wrong thing to have a bad attitude. Now look, if it fires you up and you're getting in the fight and you're, and you're serving God and you're doing good, great. But don't let, don't, don't let it overwhelm you with all the things that are going on and discourage you to the point to where you're like, man, there's all this, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, I'm out of here. I'm going to go off to the wilderness somewhere and I'm just going to say, forget you world. No, that's not what we're here to do. Um, we need to stay in the fight and we need to make sure that we stay focused on the right things and give thanks to God. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5, just a couple pages back from where we were. 
Verse number 15 reads, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, in these verses, we see a similar attitude. The prayers, the supplications that we just saw in 1 Timothy 2, we see practically repeated again in 1 Thessalonians 5.15. He's saying, you know, don't render evil for evil when someone does you wrong. Follow that which is good. He says, both among yourselves, so among the saved, and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing and everything get, give thanks to God. Everything. Everything that we do, every, every part of your life, we ought to be giving thanks. Give thanks for your family, for your children, for your spouse, for the food that you have. It is, which is one of the reasons why we, you know, I make it a point. We always give thanks in prayer unto God before we eat any of our meals. Because I don't ever want to take something like eating food for granted because it's so easy to do. You can say, I mean, my entire life, unless I have willfully fasted, I've never been without food. Thank God for that. And especially in our culture and our day and age where God has blessed, by and large, this country so much with wealth that it's easy to become complacent about those things and to just come to expect it. And which is why we see the entitlement mentality that we have today of people who think, oh, well, the government owes me this and people owe me this. Oh, and I don't have a job, so someone else needs to pay me and, uh, and I need to have food and someone needs to provide that for me because people have this sense of entitlement, which is wickedness. Nobody owes you anything. You need to work and do it for yourself. But I'll tell you what, when we, when we grow up with things, and when you don't know what it's like to be hungry, it's easy to be forgetful about how much you actually have. We need to make it a point to remember, no, you know what? I thank God and I try not to ever complain about the food that we do have. Whether, I mean, even if it doesn't taste that great, if it's, you know, whatever it may be, always be thank, hey, thank God that I can have some more nourishment for this one day, for this one meal to keep going. Thank you, Lord, for that. We need to have that. And it's not just with food. Food's one thing it's easy to become complacent about, but there's so many things in our life. We need to, to take a step back and analyze everything in our life, whether it's where you live, the things that you have, the clothing that you have, whatever it is. The little things. The little things are the easiest ones to just expect to always be there. We can't have that expectation. We see from Scripture the importance of giving thanks and, you know, it's not very difficult to give thanks when things are going well. Like, it, it's not a very hard thing to do. Um, you tend to still be in a, in a good mood. You have a good attitude. Generally, you should have a good attitude towards God. You've got a lot of things going for you. So, giving thanks isn't that hard to do. Now, it's, it's easy to remember, to be forgetful to give thanks when things are going well. But it's not always, it's not always, um, it's not a hard thing to do. So, oh, well, things are going great for me. Yeah, thanks, God. Thanks for, for everything. It's going great. <clears throat> especially when there, you know, there's more things that are apparent to be thankful for. But the harder thing to do is to be thankful when things aren't going well. Those times when you're going through the hard times, maybe you're having difficulties with your spouse, maybe you're having difficulties in your job, maybe you're having difficulties with, with whatever, I don't know. I mean, sadness and grief, you know, loss of loved ones. There's so many things that can happen when things aren't going well for you, but this is why your outlook on life in general is so critical. It's for those hard times, for those hard moments. And this is why also pride is so dangerous and why humility is so important. And we shouldn't have that entitlement type of an attitude because when things are going bad, we need to still be able to focus on the good things in our life. You need to not get too caught up in the, the here and now with, with focusing on all the bad and all the negative, but just, hey, uh, you know, I'm having this serious problem and it's painful and it hurts. But thanks God for, for providing me with some more food today. Thanks God for, for my salvation. Thanks God for, for the clothing that I'm able to wear and for keeping me warm and on, a, on a cold day like it is today. Thank you for, for having a nice comfortable setting for me. Whatever it may be, 
it'll help you to get through those hard times. And we really need to be able to, to, to force ourselves sometimes to think about the good. Because it's easy to get, to get focused on the wrong thing. <clears throat> but this, um, the entitlement attitude uh, that is mentioned, you know, we shouldn't think that we deserve things. Because that's what these people do. Is they, they think, well, I deserve to be fed. I deserve health care, Right? Everyone deserves, I deserve, hell, you need, you know, I don't care, I don't have enough money to buy my own, but I deserve it, I'm entitled to this because I'm a human being and I just should have health care, right? No, you deserve, you know what you deserve? You deserve hell because you're a sinner, like everyone else. That's what you deserve. You don't deserve other people working hard and taking care of you. You don't deserve, or I mean, even, okay, you know, because the people here aren't, don't have that type of a mindset. But it could creep in. It could creep in your life just thinking like, well, I deserve a vacation. Right? Because I'm thinking, I work hard. I work all the time. I deserve a vacation. You know what? No, you don't. You may be, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. Okay? Look, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with it if you can do it. But it's not something that you just, I deserve this. Like, this is owed to me. And that's what the word deserve means. Like, it's owed to me. Someone owes this to me. You owe it to me to take me on vacation, or you owe it to me to do whatever, fill in the blank. I mean, you, it could be anything. Don't have this mentality, because then when you start to expect things, and you start saying, you know what? This, this, is, I, this is what should be coming to me. I'm owed this. I deserve this. That's when it's gonna, you're gonna actually going to turn your mindset to be start, start to be unthankful for things. Instead of being thankful, you're going to start focusing on that wrong thing of saying, well, I deserve this, and I'm not getting it. And then you're going to be unthankful. And when you start to expect things and get used to living a certain way, you have a tendency to take the things for granted that you already have. Last place I'm going to have you turn, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're almost done here. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 6. The Bible reads, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. He's saying it's great gain to have godliness with contentment. Contentment is being satisfied with the things that you have. Being content. He says, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So he's saying you ought not to have a bad attitude and be a complainer or a murmurer complaining about things that you don't have and things that you expect. Do you have food today? Do you have clothing? He says, okay, then I don't want to hear it. If you have food and clothing, stop the complaining. Let us be there with content. Content. Say, thanks God, you've, you've given me every, all of my needs are met. They're met. I have food and I have clothing. He doesn't even say a house. Okay, he says food and clothing. And that's what Jesus had. Jesus didn't really have a home. He was, he was wandering around. He was, he was doing his ministry and teaching these things for, for the three and a half years that he was, he was out preaching and teaching. I mean, they were, him and his disciples, they were just going out and, you know, maybe they'd stay with people, you know, or whatever. I don't know what all the conditions were that they were in, but all they had was food and clothing. Basically, I mean, they, they didn't have the goods of this world. They didn't have anything. They were going around and doing the work of God. And that ought to be enough to keep you content. And if you were focused more on serving God, you wouldn't be worried about these other things that you don't have anyways. You don't need to have vehicles and chairs and furniture and houses and all this other stuff to serve God. Jesus and the disciples didn't need it. In fact, if they had it, it would probably just be a hindrance. They went out and just did the work. And um, that's what we need to be content with. 
Lastly, you know, we have Thanksgiving this week. Christmas is coming up and it's so easy to get caught up in the commercialism of those days because it's just, that's all it's turned into. The, with the media that we have these days, the, the billboard ads and the radio ads and TV ads and everything else that's going on, you know, they've done a really good job of just warping and twisting it into just being all about buying things and buying stuff and Santa Claus and all this other nonsense. We need to make sure that we are in the proper spirit and don't get caught up into the, the covetousness that is, that is being sold to you nonstop. I mean, it's already started. You are being hit with the Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and all these other days that they have to sell, 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 sell. You need to buy this stuff. You need to buy this stuff because that's what Christmas is all about. You just need to buy as much stuff as you possibly can for Christmas. That is not what Christmas is about at all. Okay? Nothing wrong with giving gifts to people. That's great, and that's even biblical when you have a celebration and giving gifts, but it doesn't mean you just have to go out and buy the stupid junk made in China just to say you've given somebody a gift for Christmas because it's your duty. Look, it's not your duty. It's not anybody's duty. It's not your And this is, this is where we need to not get caught up into this entitlement mentality of thinking, oh, well, it's Christmas. Of course I'm going to get something. And kids, remember this, especially children. Listen to this. You normally probably have gotten gifts on Christmas or maybe on your birthdays, right? Don't expect that every year. You can't have that expectation. When you expect those things, you're going to be less thankful for them when you get them because you say, well, of course I got these presents because I deserve them. Because it's my birthday, of course I'm going to get these presents. But if you're not expecting anything, when you actually get stuff, you'll be a lot more thankful. I don't expect anything. Now, I mean, I'm an adult, but still, I expect nothing from anybody ever. I mean, I don't care if it's Christmas, you know, Easter, birthdays, whatever. I don't expect anything. And we ought not to have that expectation no matter who you are. I mean, children, it may be hard. You get used to it, but this is all the more reason why. Just, just understand that you don't deserve those gifts just because it's your birthday or just because it's Christmas. People give them to you because they love you. That is why people give gifts. That's why you should give gifts, by the way. You shouldn't feel obligated because the commercials tell you you need to give gifts to somebody just because it's Christmas. It's not an obligation. It's something you do out of love. It's a way that you can show people, I love you. And here, I'm thinking about you and, and, I, and I just want you to have this. I think maybe this will lighten your day a little bit. Maybe this will bring you some joy or, or you can really use this tool, whatever it may be that you know about that person. You give them a gift that matters. It's because you love them, because you're celebrating or whatever. It's not because it's expected. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Our conversation, we shouldn't be having this covetousness communication, which is so easy to do at this time of year. Keep that in mind, not to get caught up. You know, the holidays, they're supposed to be a time of joy. They're supposed to be a time of reflection on, on the good things in your life, the Thanksgiving, the spending time with family, spending time with friends. These are what, the holidays, what these holidays are supposed to be about and supposed to be representative, celebrating the, the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, all very joyous events. Don't get caught up in the... In the not, I mean, people are literally dying these days in these shopping sales. They say, you know... And, they're, and they're, it used to be like Black Friday, you know, some stores would be open and, and in order just to get people to come out, you know, they, they, they would have these, these great sales, right? They want to have, they know a lot of people are off of work, so say, okay, well, we'll have these great sales to get people in. And now it's gotten to the point to where it's like, they're like starting on Thanksgiving Day now. It's just like, they just they keep pushing it back and it's like Thanksgiving is no longer about relaxing and enjoying time with your family. Now it's just like, Oh man, oh thanks for the dinner. I gotta go out to the store so I can buy stuff. It's ridiculous. And people literally have gotten trampled to death. 
over junk. Because that's all it is. It's just junk. This stuff's going to be burned up. It's not going to be here anymore. It's garbage. It'll probably break in a year anyways. Or what, five years? How long do you have this stuff that people are being trampled to death for? People are being trampled at Walmart. Okay, nothing in Walmart is worth a person's life. Nothing. I mean, nothing in any store is worth a person's life. But come on, people. Walmart? <laughs> but people are dying for stuff there. That's, that's ridiculous. But this is this insane, covetous mentality of thinking like, oh, I got to get these sales. And, and people have been, been brainwashed so much by this media that the, the, that's been pumped into you. Don't have, you know what? Forget it. Just wait. I hope everyone will just, just not get caught up in this nonsense and just say, you know what? I don't need to go shopping today. I never, I never will do that anymore, ever. I think we got it one time by accident. <laughs> by accident when we were in Flagstaff and the kids didn't have like winter hats and gloves and we're thinking like, well, it's a holiday. What's, what in the world would be open now? We went to Walmart. It's like they started doing the thing early that they were just like, this is crazy. Never again. Never, never will be out there. Um, at that time, but <clears throat> in closing, you know, we need to, we've got, we've got Thanksgiving this week. It's a, it's a great, a great time to reflect and be thankful for the things you have. It's important to maintain the proper attitude towards God. Think about all the good things in your life. There's so many things to be thankful for, even when things are going bad. Um, God has done so much. God has done so much for our church already. It's only been one year. I'm looking forward to the next year and the next year and the next year. And um, don't let yourself get down or discouraged um, too much when you, you need to be able to think about the good things. And, and we're going we're gonna to close. After we close, we're going to sing a song, Count Your Blessings, because that will help you to lead a joyful life. <laughs> When you're content with the things that you have, when you can just always be focused on what, what are the good things in my life, what are the good things I have, what has God given me, you will have joy in your life. We all have our burdens. We all have things that can bring us down. Focus on what you have, not on what you don't have and wish you had, because that's covetousness. And that's wickedness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please. I know this isn't necessarily something that's brand new that, that people haven't heard before, but um, I pray that you would please just help us. It's something that needs to be repeated over and over again throughout our lives, God, because we have a tendency to, to get focused on the wrong things sometimes. And I pray that you would please help us to be thankful for what you have given us and to give the recognition that you deserve for all the wonderful things that you've done for us, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you most of all for our precious gift of salvation that you paid such a high price for, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.